I'm going to uh, switch hats very quickly and uh, move on to the next part of the morning, which is our panel discussion on equality and equity in palliative care. So I'm going to ask uh, that my fellow panel members if they can turn on their cameras. Um, I, uh, we have a, a number of uh, colleagues joining us this morning for the panel. I'm going to ask them in a moment to introduce themselves. Um, but uh, I, I would just say very, very, very big welcome to Professor Mary McCarran, Dr. Paul Cregan, Martina Cregan and Joanna Davies. Um, and uh, what we hope to do with this panel session is to take some space to think and talk about this issue of equality and equity. So um, I would really encourage the audience members to use the Q&A function. Don't feel like you have to ask a question. Share your thoughts. How are you reacting to what our panelists are sharing with us? What's striking you? What's surprising you? What's scaring you? Share your thoughts through the Q&A or through the chat if you're finding the Q&A a bit clunky. And we're going to try and have a very interactive discussion between the panel and, and uh, the delegates today. So in terms of uh, uh, introductions, I'm going to go with these in order on my screen, if that's OK. So um, Martina, I can, uh, I, I can see you first. And I know you're going to tell us in a few, few moments some feedback from Voices from Care. But if you'd just like to introduce yourself to begin with. Lovely. Thank you, Suzanne. The joy of being first on someone's screen. Uh, so my name is uh, Martina Crehan. Um, I'm a member of Voices for Care, which you've already heard a little bit about this morning. So I've been a member of that group for the last uh, probably five years or so. Um, and I am there as someone who went through the caring journey. Uh, my husband uh, died of cancer and experienced end of life care seven years ago. Uh, so I'm here to talk a little bit about some of the views of the Voices for Care members on the, the wonderful topic this morning. Thank you, Martina. The next is uh, Professor Mary McCarran. Mary, would you like to introduce yourself? Apologies. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, and, and uh, lovely to meet everyone. Uh, yes, I'm a professor of aging at, at, at an intellectual disability at Trinity, and my uh, interest and, and, and lifetime interest has been in those within intellectual disability. And I'm the principal investigator of the uh, IBS TILDA, the Intellectual Disability Supplement for the Irish Longitudinal Study in Aging. And uh, we have had over uh, 200 people who have passed away over the duration of, of our uh, follow-up study. And I know Dr. Tang Ryan is, is on the call and, and is working with us on, on some of that data. So yes, I have a, a very big interest in, in the end-of-life care for this population. And I would work very closely with services throughout Ireland in terms, and indeed internationally, in terms of to help trying to address the issues. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks, Mary. Next, uh, Joanna. Hi, thank you. Um, it's lovely to be with you all today. Um, I'm Joanna Davis. I work at the Cicely Saunders Institute. I'm a PhD student there um, in the final year of my PhD, which is all about social inequality in end-of-life care. I tend to work mostly with big routinely collected data sets or data sets like the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. Um, and before I worked at the Cicely Saunders Institute, um, I worked in social policy doing kind of deprivation measurement, working on a project called the Index of Multiple Deprivation, which many of you will be familiar with and kind of include in your studies when you're trying to control for patient um, level of deprivation. So yeah, that's my, that's my background. And yeah, it's a real pleasure to be on the panel today. Lovely to have you, Joanna. Thank you. And then finally, Paul. Thanks, uh, Suzanne. So, um, Paul Griggan is my name. Um, can you hear me? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so I wear two hats. I'm a half-time uh, specialist in palliative medicine. I'm a consultant at the Black Rock Hospice here in Dublin. And also I have a, a leg in St. Michael's Hospital in Dunleary. And uh, the other half of my career is as a general practitioner. So I'm dual trained and I work as a half-time principal in a, in a practice in Dean's Grange. And I've been involved in palliative medicine uh, at specialist level for nearly 25 years. Um, and I have a particular interest in the delivery of palliative care by primary care. And so um, I suppose because I wear two hats, 
I see it from both sides, and I chair a group at the Irish Hospice Foundation uh, on primary palliative care, looking to further the development of um, palliative care in the community and how we do what we do. So that's that's me. Thank you, Paul. And I think our audience have now gotten a taster of the wonderful insights and um, expertise that we have uh, at the panel today. So I'm going to ask Martina to start us off. And uh, a, a number of members of our Voices for Care forum came together to reflect on this issue of, 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 of equity and equality in palliative care. And Martina is going to give us some starting food for thought by telling us a little bit about what came back from that group. Martina, I'll hand over to you. Lovely. Thanks again, Suzanne. And good morning again to everyone. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to present some of the collective responses of the members of Voices for Care to the, the really important theme of, of the symposium. Um, and as always, we as, as members of that group really welcome the opportunity to uh, ensure the representation of the voice of people with palliative care needs, their families and people who care for them. So um, earlier this month um, at a meeting of uh, Voices for Care members, we as a group discussed the question, what does equality and equity in palliative care mean to you? And I, I think as either a person with palliative care needs, a family member, a carer, we all have journeys and experiences which are at the one time very similar, but also very diverse and, and very individual. So our discussions and thoughts um, were, were wide ranging and, and rich, and I'm going to briefly overview the main themes from those discussions, uh, which were, were grouped by the AI IHPC. So one of the overriding themes um, really centered on empowering people to access palliative care and the elements of, of confidence and I suppose know how which might make that a, an easy or more difficult process. The confidence to ask for explanations, to seek further knowledge, to know who to ask for information in an informal way, to know the system uh, to some extent renders the journey so much easier. And there was certainly a perception that uh, perhaps education, confidence in your articulateness, knowing the system might place one in a better position to successfully access and negotiate the process of palliative care services. One of the aspects which might link to that ability then was the second identified theme, that of language. So comments such as information was shared in a language I didn't understand illustrated the perception that language used by health and social care services often acted as a barrier for some people in accessing those services. And even those who might otherwise have felt quite confident still found that the language used, the, the medical jargon, often made it difficult for people to understand what was being communicated and created those barriers. And this would obviously be particularly impactful for those for whom English is not their first language or perhaps might have a lower level of language proficiency. And also obviously the act of delivering information to all family members in, in very difficult circumstances presents unique challenges in itself. So language, um, certainly the group felt was particularly key either as a facilitator or a barrier. Similarly, geographical location emerged as another theme in relation to equality and equity. And members had very different experiences of access to palliative care services based on their geographical location. Experiences ranged from reports of complete unavailability in some locations to a perception that a Dublin location, for example, allows easier access. Aside from the existence of the services themselves, there was a sense that accessing the services which do exist might need to be differentially supported. So, for example, people in rural areas who are socially isolated for various reasons and who might be struggling in other ways might need to be given supports to access those services. That latter point links quite closely then to another theme of recognition of personal wishes and needs. And as I mentioned at the start, the, the palliative care journey or journeys are, are similar yet paradoxically unique. And there's an understanding, certainly, that there is clear messaging in relation to following the wishes and needs of the person with palliative care. But there was a sense in the group by some that not everyone is necessarily treated equitably or considered in this context. 
there was a questioning of whether palliative care services are designed to cater for the unaccustomed personal wishes and needs of a person with palliative care needs. And do patients who are perceived to be difficult or present specific challenges experience different and questionably worse care than those who are not? So there was a clear sense in the discussion that all patients' needs and wishes, even if they are considered unconventional or outside of what is deemed in inverted commas normal practice, should be recognised and met when possible. Another theme centred on the diversity of the, the human population and how that should be considered in care, um, particularly for underrepresented groups and those with specific needs. And there was a sense that information available has a, a very uh, similar and homogenous feel and tone um, across service providers. So members used words uh, such as female, white, middle class. So whilst nobody is excluded from accessing care um, based on ethnicity or sexuality, social class, age, religion, etc., how services are set up may impact uh, delivery of care and how inclusive they are or are perceived to be. So there was a sense that there's a real need to recognise the diversity and inclusivity required to develop specific palliative and end of life care services and supports, which cater specifically for diverse needs and where everyone sees themselves represented. Uh, members based on their experiences um, also identified a gap in palliative care services and supports for those in specific circumstances, such as those who are homeless and uh, people with mental health issues. So very much focusing on, on how responsive services can be to those who are um, vulnerable in, in multiple ways and, and in ways which, which intersect in terms of that experience. A final core theme focused on availability of services. So members thought that the structure of services, mainly between nine and five and limited availability of out of hour services, uh, quite often impacted access to 24 seven palliative care. Uh, there was a sense that out of our services are not always seen as patient centred and that services and supports need to be designed around the patient and the family carer to map out periods of concern for care, which in themselves will obviously be quite individual from circumstance to circumstance. Then outside of the main themes, additional comments centred on the needs of those providing care, family members, etc., and the equity issues they might face in both accessing and understanding services. And a sense that generic policies are, are not necessarily suitable for everyone. So, for example, people with intellectual disabilities have very specific needs. So from all of that, you can, I hope, get a, a sense of the main themes emerging uh, from the discussions of the group. Um, I think there's a, a connection and, and overlapping between them and a strong sense from the group that it's important that health and social care professionals have knowledge to provide adequate palliative care in cooperation with the person and family. So the importance of the partnership in the process and the need to move towards a more flexible palliative care service delivery that embraces diversity. So. I just wanted to finish um, those thoughts of the, the collective um, with a, just a, a quote that I came across, which I think personally is really reflective of these discussions. Um, and it's a quote from Caroline Belden on uh, the difference between equality and equity. So she says that equality is leaving the door open for anyone who has the means to approach it. Equity is ensuring there's a pathway to that door for those who need it. And I think the group discussions um, that we had very much reveal the different nature of that pathway and how we can continue to assist everyone to reach that door. So thank you very much. Martina, thank you so much for centering us on this, this topic for our panel discussion. And I suppose the question I would put to all four panel members to start is, what's your reaction to that picture that the Voices for Care four members have painted for us? Of, of the issues here. Is there anything in particular that strikes you or jumps out at you that you'd like to, to, to briefly comment on? Who would like to kick us off? Paul? Uh, well, thanks very much, Martina. That's an excellent uh, uh, summary of, uh, of, of the issues, actually. Nearly every one of those issues resonates with me. A lot of the work we're trying to do in, in improving how we deliver public care in the community in particular um is centered around an awful lot of that you know i could certainly speak to 
some of the efforts to, uh, that we're trying to uh, introduce around uh, accessing out of hours, um, uh, obsc- informing out of hours practitioners um, electronically from GP surgeries about um, up to date information. Um, the only the only out of hours person in the community you can access is a GP. Actually, there's no out of hours nursing um, floating around. There's no other um, people. And they, they, very, very often the person who comes to you in the other setting is a, a GP that's unknown to you. Um, a lot of them are, uh, are non-nationals. A lot of them um, uh, don't know the geography or the areas. Um, and English may not be their first language. And a lot gets lost in the subtlety. Um, so there's a lot of effort uh, going in to try to improve that. Uh, we're very well aware of that. Um, and um, you're quite right to point out out of ours as a, as a, as a black hole. Um, there's a lot of work going in from the Irish College of GPs and the IHF to and the HSE to try and upskill GPs. They, they, we have set up a, we have reinvigorated a pelvic care course for GPs in the community. Uh, it's now in its fourth iteration in the last uh, two years. Um, online uh, technology has transformed how that course has been delivered, mm-hmm. and um, we have had about 120 GPs through that. Um, I would hope that that will carry on at 60 to 70 GPs a year. Um, that will probably take in a third or half of the, of the uh, workforce over the next 10, 15 years. Um, so there's a lot of work going in there. The one, uh, I, I, I suppose I can't really speak for my nursing colleagues, but we are looking to try to also um, upskill uh, public health nursing and also um, practice nursing and uh, courses around how uh, they do what they do. Um, and the other area then really is around structured care. I'm going to come back to that in a, a bit later and talk a bit about that and how uh, we could improve um, the role of primary care in the community. So an awful lot of that. Medical ease has been a big problem since uh, I qualified in 1988, and it's going to be a big quali- uh, problem for the next 100 years. Um, we keep having to re- uh, remind doctors, nurses, and anyone working in healthcare that actually it's a different language and you have to you know, uh, adapt your language to the people you're looking after. Um, geography you mentioned and easier access in Dublin, that's not always the case. And uh, that's certainly a perception when you live in, in the country, but you're right in some areas, but you're wrong in others. And accessing carers, particularly in Dublin, is a nightmare at the moment. Uh, it is easier in the country. So th- there are the uh, uh, pros and cons to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also mentioned something else that jumped out of me, uh, psychiatry. Um, yeah, you, you're quite right. When people neatly fit into the 95% confidence intervals, that's fine. But when people have uh, quirks that, that make them slightly, um, you know, on, on different ends of a harmonious choir, um, they, uh, and they're, they're, they're not quite fitting into the system, it's very hard for the system to adapt to it. And a recent one I've come across is a man who is an anti-vaxxer, an anti-COVID, anti-vaxxer, non-believer in COVID. And he had a very difficult experience in a hospital recently uh, on the basis of his anti-vax beliefs. And yet he has a real need from a palliative care point of view. That's just an example of a new one that I haven't come across. But mm-hmm. there are lots of reasons why people can be marginalized and we have to work very hard uh, against that. Mm-hmm. I'll stop now because I could go on all morning. So. <laughs> no, thank you, Paul. And I've made a little note that I am going to make sure we get back to your structured care point. But okay. um, Joanna, you want to come in now? Thank you. Thank you, Martina, for that really, um, really interesting summary of the discussions that you had. I can see that, um, you know, lots of the issues are very personal and and very kind of heartfelt. So one of the things that really jumped out to me was this idea of kind of multiple elements of people's characteristics that create disadvantage in their lives. Um, And really it kind of taps into this idea of kind of cumulative disadvantage, the idea that things like geography, language, cultural barriers, religious barriers, they're not separate, they all kind of combine and build upon each other for people. Um, And I think, you know, working in research, one of the things that we really struggle with is how to look at all of those things together. The temptation is always to kind of separate these things but we need to get much better at looking at um, the overall picture for people. And I think the the pandemic has really brought into focus for us the need to particularly 
very importantly look at the combination of um, socioeconomic disadvantage alongside ethnicity and to not separate the two things. It's not one or the other is important. Mm. All of these factors are important um, and it's how we can pay kind of proper attention to that. Um, the other thing that, that really um, sort of jumped out to me and struck a chord with some of the discussions that I have with clinical colleagues is this you know, idea of kind of recognising the limitations of the workforce, that you know, there is a tendency, I think, in palliative care, but in all areas of health for the workforce to not necessarily represent the um, communities that they serve. You know, there's a tendency for doctors and nurses to be white and middle class. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a training need Oh, Joanna, we're having slight technical gremlins um, from your end. I'm, I'm surprised we've gotten an hour and a half into our event before we, we have any can... gremlins. Joanna, can you hear us? I might, I might give, uh, give Joanna a moment to, to possibly... Uh, speak to her router to try and convince it to be better behaved, which is what we do in my house when we have technical issues. And maybe, Mary, I might come to you for any sort of initial reactions or, or reflections on the, the insight shared by our Voices for Care colleagues. Yeah, well, um, thank you. And I, I, I totally, you know, can resonate with everything that Martina has, has, has spoken about and, 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 and so reassured and hopeful by to, uh, Paul's efforts in, in trying to, 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 to make palliative care more accessible. And certainly when you're working with people with intellectual disability, which is the population that I've worked with now for probably all of my career, they are a complex population. They are often very marginalised. They don't have wealth. They don't have a voice very often. Many of them are working, living perhaps with this older population who I'm supporting would have lived maybe in an institution for all of their lives. And um, uh, in, in a more learned society, we now understand that that wasn't a good place for people. And we have moved people out to more community-based group homes and supporting people to live with family. But the most distressing thing for me now as I look at what has happened is that now if people reach the end of their lives and are living with chronic illness and, 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 and perhaps death, that there is often the narrative is we don't have the resources to support people here. We just transfer them and move them back into another congregated setting, i.e. a nursing home. And this is really, I think we'll have done such a disservice to people uh, if that is the case. Many of the staff in group homes and indeed families, it is the very last thing that they want and the individual themselves. So I really, you know, we, you know, we've got to skill up nurses, Paul, and I'm, I'm really glad to, to, to hear you talk about that and, and other groups. But, you know, this is a population who are, who, are, who are living in our society, who have been so marginalized for so long. And we have got, and I know that Karen Ryan and people like Regina have, have, have been doing excellent work in, in this space, but there's so much still to be done. And, I, you know, very often there is this crisis decision making, there is very little, perhaps good advanced planning, and there is this business of, you know, a different GP calling at weekends or at different times who simply do not know the individual and do not listen to the staff or the family care or whoever who knows this individual well, and, mm -hmm. and you have so often people being transferred even to acute care when mm. they're nearly approaching and taking the last breath, which is completely distressing for the individual and for everybody involved in care. So, you know, this is a, a group that, you know, I think are, are, are very, you know, need to be served. And, and mm. I'm, I'm, I'm really, but I can totally resonate with everything that Bettina and Paul have said. Mm. I think what I would, I, I, one of the things I'm very conscious of is that life doesn't respect the edges of categories. So the idea that someone might be um, at the end of life, they, someone might ha be experiencing poverty, that someone might have a disability, that someone might have additional needs. Life doesn't respect that, that there are lines between those categories. 
I'm going to move on in a moment to our first question um, for the panel. But Martina, just before we move away from that, the, the Voices for Care panel, can I ask you, if you don't mind, what, what surprised you from that conversation you had with your, your colleagues? Um, was there anything in particular that just really surprised you in that discussion? I don't think there was anything that surprised me as, as such. Um, I, I think, you know, had I been asked beforehand the, the types of topics and the types of themes that would emerge, I, I probably have been quite right. And mm. um, knowing the discussions that, that you know, we, we, we have as a group in, in our meetings and so on. The one I suppose that, that did, um, didn't resonate with me quite as much and, and Paul picked up on it in, in his comments is, you know, that perception that if you are Dublin based, that you have access to, you know, many, many more services. Um, and certainly from a personal perspective, you know, I am Dublin based. Uh, my, my husband obviously was Dublin based uh, during his end of life uh, journey. And that certainly, you know, wasn't necessarily the experience. Um, okay. So just because, you know, you're perceived to live in a, in a, a situation where you might have ease of access, you know, that, that's not necessarily the case. So I think it's, it's, it's not quite as, um, it's not quite as uh, balanced in favour of, of, uh, of Dublin as, as, as people might think. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, it was lovely to see those, that recognition of um, that need to, to, yes, you know, look at, at all of those facets and aspects of, of someone's life. You know, we are made up of so many things, our ethnicity, our religion, our, our social class, etc. So the one size fits all, you know, just isn't feasible and, and, and doesn't work. And, and just that recognition that that needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah, not only does one size not fit all, but one language does not fit all. And some of the comments have picked up on that idea of accessible language. So I'm, I'm going to start with a question. I'm conscious that we've, we've lost Joanna and uh, hopefully uh, the, the gremlins that are preventing her from engaging with us will disappear and she'll be able to rejoin us. But for, for, for Paul, Mary and, and Martina, we have a question from uh, Kieran Carrer, who's a consultant in palliative medicine in Belfast. And Kieran asks, how do we ensure that people with dementia and frailty uh, as an uh, as an additional uh, factor, get equal access to palliative care services. Uh, Joanna, you're very welcome back. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure what happened. Um, no, you're okay. You're okay. Joanna, I'm just, yeah, I'm just pitching a question to the panel now, so you might take a moment to think. And the question is, how do we ensure that people with dementia and frailty get equal access to palliative care services? So, who would like to uh, start, Paul? And then Mary? I'm happy to come in on that, Suzanne. So dementia, one of the big problems about palliative medicine is that it grew up in cancer. And in the cancer world, um, if you go back to the, to the trajectory of a person's illness and how they decline, the cancer world is, is uh, relatively um, uh, you can pre uh, predictable. You can predict when somebody comes off treatment, generally the rate at which a person declines and an expected uh, time frame for their death. And you can plan services in around that very, very well. The problem with dementia is, although the average uh, man will be four and a half years, the average woman 5.2 years, uh, the variation of that could be anything from six months to 20 years. And you can't have specialist palliative care in around uh, dementia for 20 years. So you need to develop a model where you come in for the difficult bits and you leave for the bits that are stable. And that's the bit that palliative care is trying to learn at the moment. And it's quite, it's quite difficult. We have a tsunami of, of, uh, of demographics coming our way. We all know that the numbers of dementia, uh, of patients with dementia are going to explode in the next 20 years uh, in this country. So we really do have to get our act together about how we, how we deal with end stage dementia. By and large, dementia uh, is, is uh, people with dementia are better managed, not in specialist palliative care units and not in hospital. So they are better managed in community, either in their own homes are in residential care homes, settings where they are that they're used to and settings where they are um, uh, less uh, agitated. I had a lady dying at home last week with an advanced dementia looked after by her sister. Um, she would have been scared witless going into, she had an aspiration pneumonia from which she obviously wasn't going to recover. She would have been scared witless going into a hospital and going through all that palaver. And we made a decision there and then with the family not to admit her. And she died very peacefully at home. You know, the, the, the location is really, really important uh, for how people are managed with dementia. 
And the third thing I was going to say is um, that the areas that specialist palliative care get involved with a lot are uh, advanced care planning, uh, cry saves, and end of life care. And I'm not sure if specialist palliative care should be involved in much else. And I think the, the generalist care, so from primary care teams out in communities, that's where the real uh, strength of, of managing dementia lies, uh, as well as nursing home um, staffing. Thank you very much, Paul. Mary, I know you wanted to come in, and, and Mary, you and I know each other very well. I know dementia is a topic that you have a considerable commitment and energy into in your career. What, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I, I totally agree very much with what Paula said. And, and certainly, um, you know, I think uh, we, we need the availability of palliative care. People know how to access it and that they are uh, available when necessary. But certainly for people with Down syndrome, which we know that there's a very high prevalence of dementia, the developing dementia very young in life, um, and, and, and these are all complex. And it is exactly as Paul is saying, you know, really trying to support this person to live in the home of their choice, in the community of their choice, with family and friends, and bring in the supports and resources around it. And we would have worked very effectively with the life of St. Francis Hospice, with Marymount, who would have brought in palliative care to support for, for this complex care needs. But we need to be better at understanding and fusing the horizons of different care approaches, that is gerontological care, intellectual disability care, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to fuse the horizons of those care because as many of the principles is underpin palliative care that are just good care and there should be good care across the board. So to me, it is around fusing the horizons. And we should only be using the skills of people. You know, these are very specialist people who are very stretched. And we need to use them optimally and people and when we need them. So, so I would agree very much with what mm. Paula said, but yes. And I'm very struck that the, the palliative care competency framework really did identify the, 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 the palliative care competencies, knowledge, awareness, skills that, 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 that should be present across lots of different yeah. um, medical, health and social care professionals. So recognising that there is this, this, this capacity across different settings. Martina or Joanna, would you like either of you like to, to come in on this question of, of, of dementia and frailty and, and palliative care access? Joanna? I mean, I think kind of picking up on something that Paul mentioned about kind of the origins of the hospice movement being in cancer, I think we kind of see echoes of that still very strongly today. And we know that the vast majority, something like 95% of people who die in hospices um, have cancer. Um, so thinking about inequality from a kind of di diagnosis point of view, I think is, is really important um, to think about how we can make services more accessible across the board. Um, you know, some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier about access to benefits and the six month rule and, and how that's been scrapped to create this 12 month rule, you know, it's really easy to see how for lots of patients that's irrelevant, you know, that kind of um, definite prognosis is just not available. So I think we have got to really challenge ourselves to think um, outside of the kind of um, typical patient journey that we really, I think, still tend to associate with cancer patients. Mm. Martina, when, when, when Paul made that point about how palliative care has such a strong connection to cancer treatment and diagnosis and, and management, but that obviously it has a huge role to play in very different um, diagnoses, illness trajectories. Um, I, I was conscious again of the variety that exists within our, our Voices for Care members in terms of the, the context of their and their family members' palliative care journeys. Is there anything that resonated for you about that idea of recognising that there's a strong connection to certain illnesses, but a huge potential to be applied in others? Yeah, I, I think it's a really, really important point. And, and I think it relates very much to the, you know, the, the public discourse and how we encourage and manage the public discourse around the continuing understanding of what palliative care is. Um, and I think, 
you know, for many years, most people would, would probably have associated palliative care with, you know, yes, that is something for people with a, a, a cancer or a terminal cancer diagnosis. Mm. So quite a lot of the messaging and, and quite a lot of the, you know, public communication around palliative care is now very much centered on, on you know, opening that discourse. So not only continuously helping people to understand what palliative care is, you know, how early it can start, how it is about you know, living your, your your best life for as long as you can, but that also it is it is not illness specific. That there are you know so many different uh, different illnesses and, and different journeys that it can can assist, and that it is is absolutely suitable for. So, it's part of that continuing conversation. Um, I, I think in terms of of the community at, at large, which is really really key. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Martina. Mary, you want to come in there. Yeah, just supporting, I think, uh, the, the, this discussion that, I mean, it is getting recognition that, you know, things like people do die from dementia, and it is rec- getting that recognition, even on, on things like death search, uh, you know, this is a big issue, you have to come up with something else, so so we need to understand that people, you know, that dementia is a terminal illness, so people will die from it, it mm-hmm. you know, so, so and, and that is some of the complexity, and that's why I think palliative care and, and, and its approaches are still nested very much in people's heads within cancer care. Um, so, so we need to change that discourse and, and narrative and, and thinking at public at large, I think, as Martina said. Um, and I know that we know just one project from the Palliative Care Research Network, uh, Suzanne Timmins and colleagues in, in UCC are looking at the contribution of palliative care to dementia care. So I think yeah. that, that connection is there. Um, I'm, I'm going to get a uh, chair's privilege again, and I'm going to pitch a question to all of you if I can. And it comes, Martina, from from several of the things that that Voices for Care picked up. And I want to, I want you to think about language, but I'm conscious that with language, it's so layered because yes, um, Paul and others have picked up on people both who are receiving palliative care supports, but also practitioners for whom English might not be their first language. Um, But I'm also conscious of, as a researcher, the challenge of plain language when I'm talking about my research and I'm hoping to engage with um, any population, any members of the public, but particularly around, say, palliative care, that I have to think about the assumptions I'm making about the language I'm using. And I sometimes worry that there's an issue of awareness, just being aware that I, as a researcher, have a language I'm very comfortable with but that might not be the language that the person I want to speak with or hear from is comfortable with. Can I ask you all, when you think about the challenge of language in contributing to um, equity and, 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 and equality, I, what are your thoughts on, on simple things that we can be aware of as practitioners or researchers or members of the public about the language relating to palliative care end of life, promoting that equality of access. Who would like to kick off? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to, to kick off because I think language coming from working with people with an intellectual disability is just, you know, such a complex area. And we really have to understand, you know, the level of understanding that the individual has. And we have to bring our communication to that level. And we have to get, get in on the conversation with with, with trying to see where, what's the person's level of understanding of what we're about. So, so I think that is just so important because things, you know, we have people with intellectual disability who are varying levels of disability and uh, depending on, on what that, and the understanding may be very complex. Also as well, I think when people hear the word palliative of care, they immediately think, well, that's the end. The person is dying, but they're in palliative of care. And, and so, so there is, uh, you know, there is, a narrative, I think, around, there's a fear around even the word for many people because they associate it perhaps with death mm-hmm. and, 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 and that phase. So, so I do think we have, what we have to do as researchers and practitioners is come to the level of understanding and understand the level of understanding that any individual person is at. And that's the starting point for me all, mm-hmm. is, is getting in, entering their world, where they are at at that time. Mm, thank you, Mary Anna. And actually, your comment makes me think that it, it's broader than language. Even it's about preferred communication, for which 
spoken language may be just one preference and, and other forms may be there. Paul, Joanna, Martina, does anyone want to respond to that question of language and, and, and equity? Martina, I think you want to come in there. Uh, yeah, no, that, that that's fine. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, I, I, I think just to, to follow on from, from Mary's thoughts there and, and your comments there, uh, Suzanne, you know, it is very much, I think, about that listening and questioning piece of communication skills. And, you know, as, as you were both talking, I was I was thinking about that very aspect of, you know, the, the, the type of terminology that somebody actually would like used. And, and it, it really struck me in, in Sam's presentation this morning about, you know, even the use of the word patient uh, in respect to somebody at, at, at end of life care. And terms, you know, speaking very personally, uh, my husband had an allergic reaction to the term carer. He he just, you know, did not want that terminology used in relation to, to me as his wife or, or, or other family members. So it's that, I mean, it's, it's so complex, but it's, I think, thinking about that negotiated process between the researcher, the clinician, you know, whoever it is that the individual is, is meeting and, and, and finding a way to try and tease that out and find a language and terminology that is actually comfortable and, and sits well with those individuals. That, that's not easily done, but I, I, I think it's really, really key in establishing that trust and that relationship and that partnership. Thank you, Martina. Paul, I think you want to come in there as well. Yeah, it is a really, really important thing. You can see why people who are non-nationals struggle with this. If I try to do this in French, I'm going to make a complete hames of uh, palliative medicine because it's very hard to pick out subtlety. And palliative medicine and, and, and palliative, palliative approach is very much around the subtle. The other thing that it is, it is around is what's not said and um, it, the reading between the lines. So you may be listening to somebody, but you're listening to what's not being said in a conversation. That's the elephant in the room, and that's that's a very big um, piece of communication. There's, there's no such thing as no communication. Um, if somebody's not saying something, there's a reason why they're not saying it, and just moving it around that. There are some landmine words that we I avoid. One of them is an event. Uh, for some reason, um, when I say somebody had an event, that is an explosive word for a lot of people. You know, it wasn't an event like a celebration. It was a terrible night of pain, you know, a pain event. You know, I've learned that that's a bad one. And the other thing that we, we and I've noticed it here as well, we, is, is dying. You know, a lot of people avoid the word dying and passing away, moving on. There's lots of euphemisms for that. Now, that, that maybe is a personal thing. I much prefer the straight out discussion on, on, on dying. But for a lot of people, uh, it's too uh, naked a word and they would prefer something, some kind of euphemism to soften that a bit. So I think when we meet with people, again, part of a palliative approach, and certainly what I learned in the early years was building upon what a person already says. So in a conversation, as they're telling you the story and relating the events to date, you are listening to what language they use within that and mm. you join in that language. You know? mm. So I, I, I would follow uh, what a patient says and try and individualize it. I think that's the point you're making, Martina, that it isn't a, a one size fits all when you're speaking to somebody mm. with advanced degree. Joanna, not to put you on the spot, but one of our, our delegates, Aileen, has actually has asked whether the term specialist is 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 not inclusive, and does that that word create a barrier to, you know, promoting equality of access and and and, and access to services? Sorry to put you on the spot, but because I'm taking advantage of you being next up. Um. I, I mean, I know that that is something that is debated a lot and, you know, should we use the term palliative, should we use the term specialist? Um, and I think um, there are lots of kind of interesting conversations to be had about that. And I, I don't know if there are really any answers. People, some people are for using it, some people are against. But I think, you know, it's really interesting to hear um, the other members of the panel talk about their clinical and their patient experience and the kind of nuance of language and how important it is. One of the things that um, we've talked about sometimes at the System Saunders Institute is just the naming of, of hospices. They're often um, associated with um, religious organisations or particular kind of um, saints or um, religious figures. And I think, you know, that um, is something that we, we do need to kind of look at Particularly, and think about how that um, might make people feel excluded. 
I think the one thing that I'd like to add to this discussion about language is, to, is sort of picking up on something that um, Paul mentioned, which is about other languages and how this would be, you know, difficult to talk about in French, for example. Um, but kind of at a practical level, um, one of the things that I think we can do more and kind of do better is in terms of translating patient information leaflets and the use of translators as well, which I think can be a bit problematic and is like typically a very underfunded service in hospitals. Um, and um, yeah, just kind of recognising that there might be cultural barriers towards talking about care and towards receiving care um, that, that can be really, really difficult to navigate. And I think, again, kind of the COVID pandemic has highlighted that, um, that cultural barriers are something that we really, really need to consider in terms of um, whether people are happy to have certain types of care. Mm. I, I, John, I remember a research project that I was reviewing for a particular reason, and it was aiming to look at multiple uh, language groups. And um, but it was a PhD student who didn't have the funding to translate everything. But what they did was they had one line of the information sheet translated into every language that the study might reach, and that was if you've any questions about the information here or any difficulties understanding the information, please contact. And she had contacts personally with the different people who spoke the different languages. And I thought that was very creative. It, it recognized the limitations of the resources she had, but also put those resources in a very effective place. Um, and it was a very small change that was very respectful of the fact that she would be talking to lots of different groups. Thank you all for that. I'm going to move on to an, a, a next question. Um, and I'm, don't worry, I'm keeping time, uh, keeping a watch on our time because a chair should never play with the coffee break. Um, so the question comes in from Marianne, who is a Macmillan palliative care nurse um, in, in Belfast. And Marianne mentions that she's done some uh, research around schizophrenia and the experience of people with schizophrenia at the end of life. So she asked, how do we feel this knowledge, uh, the knowledge and research is within this particular area? So again, looking at the crossover between mental health needs and palliative care. So schizophrenia and end of life care, the, the needs of people who have a diagnosis. Who would, would anyone like to, to pick up on, on this particular area? It might be more specialist uh, a, a topic. Yeah, I, I'm, I'll, I'll try my best on this one. Um, so you don't die of schizophrenia usually. Um, it's usually accompanying another illness. So you have breast cancer and schizophrenia, or MND and schizophrenia. Um, so you're having to manage it as a comorbid condition. And um, a lot of schizophrenia is managed at, at primary care level. Um, a lot of stable schizophrenia is, uh, and mental health uh, in general. But I don't. I, we shouldn't be afraid to call in specialists in psychiatry to to help us. You know, a lot of people are linked um, with specialists, and uh, I think one of the, you know, one of the one of the things you don't like doing perhaps is 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 reaching out to pull in other people to manage your patients. But I think as a specialist, that's part of the recognition you need to know when you're at your depth, and particularly in psychotic situations that are unstable, you do need your psychiatry colleagues alongside that. Um, by and large, um, my, my biggest problem on mental health is the services, other services. So people who are stable from a cancer point of view um, and mental health will tend to say, well, this is a cancer problem. And cancer will tend to say, well, that's a mental health problem. And people uh, end up falling between two or three stools, you know, uh, and you can't access um, uh, monies from the cancer side because they say, well, that should be coming from uh, the, the, the psychiatry side and vice versa. So that's a particular difficulty. But by and large, managing um, schizophrenia is is well done by primary care, who are very good at managing 80% of it. Yeah. Mm. I suppose highlighting the need for that sort of, again, collaborative approach to uh, addressing the needs of individuals who have end-of-life care needs or palliative care needs, that they may be, be dealing with and, and living with other conditions 
um, and dealing with other specialists. Mary, you wanted to come in there and then... Yeah, well, it's, it's just really the fact by earlier point where I said we need to fuse the horizons of all of these different disciplines and work together, and that can be mental health care, ID care, gerontological care, et cetera, et cetera. And it is, we've got to be open and willing and understand that, you know, that there is other specialist expertise out there we were very often of people who've been intellectual disability, and some people may again have complex mental health issues, or, or they may have other issues associated with the disability. So bringing all of those people together in a way that really is person-centered and uses the skills and resources in the right way for people, I think is what's really important. So it is that fusing the horizons of different care. Thanks, Mary. It's a very powerful image uh, Ed, to keep in mind. Joanna, you wanted to come in as well? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add that, you know, the palliative care for um, people with schizophrenia or other mental health issues is a hugely under-researched area. And, you know, the health need for people with um, mental health problems is huge. I think, you know, a report came out a few years ago looking at life expectancy for people with mental health problems. It, it's shockingly, shockingly much, much lower than the general population. I mean, things like smoking are much higher um, and the you know disease and disability burden is much, much higher. So there's a real kind of disconnect there. There's a lot of need and very little kind of uh, research into um, particularly palliative care, but other services for those for those groups. Mm. Um, Martina, I don't know if you wanted to comment on this issue, but there has been a question that has come through specifically for you and actually picks up on some of the things that have been said here. And it's from uh, Peter. Um, and it links back to this idea of, of, of uh, person-centeredness. So Peter was interested to hear any views from your conversation with your other Voices for Care measures about the potential um, barrier that a lack of response, responsiveness to the individual might create. So being aware of the individual's preferences, their language, any, uh, Peter uses the term, unconventional wishes that they might have. Um, Peter wonders if, if that, even though palliative care presents itself as patient-centered, is it, is it re responding to that individuality within both people with end of life uh, and palliative care needs and their, their, their wider family. Any thoughts on, on that? Are they responsive or not responsive to the, the actual individual and all that, that, that makes them an individual? I, I think, you know, and, and, and thinking about the, the comments and the discussions and, and maybe answering this from, from a personal perspective as well, it, it, it probably is quite, um, <laughs> A, a, an individual um, experience. So, you know, I think depending on the relationship that you've managed to establish, depending on, you know, your, for us, the, the relationship to the GP was, was really important and, and, and really, really beneficial. Um, and I think all of the factors that we identify as teams, you know, plays into that. It's, it, it's a very, very complex process. Um, I think part of Peter's question, he might have put it into the, the chat as well, was about, you know, where this sits in the, the, the is it a rest of the health system problem um, as, as such? And I think that's really interesting to, to think about in, in, in this context. Um, and again, you know, I can't speak for all of the members of Voices for Care, um, but obviously all of us will not just have uh, encountered palliative care, we will have obviously regardless of what the illness is, have encountered lots of different um, uh, health services and, and, and so on. And I think, you know, it, 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 it is um, a more general issue and, and a more general question. Um, and I think, you know, goes back to in the medical system, you know, the, the heart of, of training, you know, health professions training and how we build that or how that is built mm -hmm. into, into curricula. And that we make our future healthcare professionals, you know, really aware of, of the diversity of the population that they are, are, are going to encounter, that are going to be their patients in, in the future, and that they are going to have to learn those skills of, of being responsive uh, mm. to lots of different factors and lots of different facets of those individuals. So I, I absolutely think, you know, it, it is an issue that is, is 
is we're talking about it here in the context of palliative care, but it's a much, much broader question and a much, much broader issue. Thank you, Martina. I'm conscious we're in the, the last few minutes, and while I would sit here and talk with the four of you all day, um, I think that the other uh, um, speakers on our programme would not be happy with me. Um, so I want to put a question to, to each of you, similar to the one I asked Sam at the end. When you were asked to be part of this panel, um, and in the time since, as you talked about, you know, what we would talk about and, and how you might respond. Can I ask each of you, is there something that you would like to say to the, the attendees here again, researchers, clinicians, um, uh, members of our Voices for Care Forum, users of palliative care service, carers, uh, even though Martina again, some people don't like that term, um, from across the island of Ireland, from multiple organisations, institutions, disciplines. Thinking of that audience of, of, of 80 people, given this challenge around equity and equality, is there something you would like to say to this group about what you would like to see them doing or where you would like to see them going with this issue to take it to the next level? Sort of like, do you have a wish list for the Palliative Care Research Network and the wider community? Who would like to come in? Uh, I might just come in very quickly because uh, I, I started off by saying primary palliative care is a particular interest of mine, and I would really love to see um, general practice morph into doing exactly what Martina says. They they absolutely have the skills to do this, but they need the opportunity to do this and to meet the expectations of the people they're looking after in the community. There are ways to do that. Um, I really feel I'd like to talk to government and to clinicians because that's where the problem lies, is persuading the uh, governments to move in this direction. There is a huge amount of palliative care coming down the line and it's, it's, it's going to have to be managed um, largely in community because we haven't got the inpatient resources to do that, and specialist resources to do that. And uh, I would love to see structures put in place on a generalist primary care level uh, to manage that and to be open to change. Um, and that would be my wish list. And, and, okay. and for researchers, there is a glaring um, gap in uh, primary palliative care. You need to look at how uh, patients are managed by primary care, their experiences in primary care, and what happens pre-hospital, pre-hospice, pre-specialist palliative care input. All of that area is, is not being researched in this island properly and is being researched largely in Australia, Singapore, out, out in other places. So yeah. we need to do that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Paul. Very, very uh, really, really directed uh, call to people who may be on, on our webinar. Um, anyone else like to step in with their, their message or their wish list for this group? Well, I, I'm happy to step in and, and to say there's, you know, there's some work happening in the field of intellectual disability but they continue to be a very marginalised population, even regardless of end-of-life care. Uh, so even going to a GP and accessing general practice and going into hospitals is a very stressful event for this population at, at any time in their lives. So we, do, we need huge skilling up of a, a professionals working in the healthcare sector and how to communicate with people with intellectual disability we, we both at primary uh, GP level at, at, at medical training, nurse training and social care training. Um, and uh, we certainly need to ensure that those who are most vulnerable in our populations, like people with severe mental health problems, like maybe people with intellectual disability, like traveling community, whatever else, that we don't, don't decide that those populations are too difficult to include in research. <laughs> and uh, we don't just, make the efforts to go and, and to involve the hard to reach population and we're running you know the IDS building now we're going into our 15th year and you know people with ID you know have, have been able to be involved and wanted to be involved so I really want to encourage people here today to make sure we get to hear the voice of the voiceless. Thank you very much Mary. Joanna? Thanks um yeah I think um kind of an important point for me is that we know that there is social inequality in end-of-life care and um, but it's not inevitable and I think um, it's really important to kind of hold on to that idea that we can change things 
Um, and something that's really important to that and kind of picking up on what Mary was saying is that we need targeted interventions um, that support marginalised groups to access care more equitably. Um, and we also need to think about evaluating the interventions and services that we do have for how effective they are for different subgroups. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, Joanna. I know there was a project that I was involved in a number of years ago, the Kindle project, and it did pick up on that need to recognise the the, the 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 diversity that was in any population of of, of palliative care service users, patients, carers, things like that. Martina, I hope you don't mind me coming to you last, but I I like the fact that you started us on our reflections, and and I'm I'm going to hand over to you to. To, for, for your final thoughts, again, anything that you would, any call that you would issue to the, the, the attendees here today from, on, on behalf of Voices for Care. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, very struck and, and very similar uh, comments uh, following on that research line by, by Mary and, and Joanna. It was wonderful at the, at the start, Suzanne, to, to you know see your presentation and the overview of research and, and how much PPI and and voice of, of populations is, is being embedded within that. I'm, I'm a great fan of, of, you know, qualitative research and looking at the lived experience. And, and I think the more of that that we can do and, and in general, but also as, as um, Mary pointed out with, with particular populations and, and so that we can really target then future development and, and, and future resource. And I think just generally then, uh, I suppose my, my final point back to that education and, and, and training issue is, you know, I think also about kind of normalizing end of life or, or palliative care within training systems. So mm. if you're going to be a health professional, you are going to come across patients at end of life at some point. And I think, you know, we, we've, we've quite often perhaps um, you know, develop a training systems, uh, particularly in initial training, which is, is very curative focused. Um, mm. And I think just that concept of palliative care that, you know, trainees, students can can get an understanding of that and, and start to, to to really interact with that as, as early as possible is is really important just in terms of all of the issues that we've, we've spoken about this morning. OK, thank you very much, Martina. So I'm going to finish by thanking our panellists, Paul, Mary, Joanna and Martina for their reflections, their thoughts, their suggestions for us. I'd also like to thank uh, those of you who shared questions and indeed comments in the chat. Uh, 